We're going to begin a study in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Today is going to be a, a night, rather, where we just simply provide a background to it. And, but I want us to be in Acts chapter number 17. And I've entitled this particular series, uh, Faithful to the End. And I think it describes uh, much of the center of the book of 1 Thessalonians as a tremendous amount of attention is going to be given to the coming of Christ in both 1 and 2 Thessalonians. It's in many ways a church that is uh, commended on a lot of levels. They're not a perfect church. Uh, they do still have a number of issues that uh, also have to be able to be resolved. But uh, being faithful to the end is what we've uh, entitled this particular series, Acts 17. I'll be there in just a little while. The city of Thessalonica was uh, located in the region of Macedonia. That would be the area uh, that would be referred to as northern Greece. It was uh, an ancient kingdom that became uh, largely controlled by the Greeks, even becoming at one point in time the uh, base of operations for Alexander the Great as he would uh, seek to conquer uh, Western Asia. Uh, Alexander the Great died, you may know, unexpectedly and had no children to be able to uh, send his kingdom to. And the result of it was that it was divided among four generals who over a period of probably 40 to uh, maybe 50 years all fought to try to expand their own territory. An individual by the name of Cassander actually became the ruler of the known as Macedonia, and it was under his leadership that Thessalonica became a, an important city, named it after his wife, who also happened to be uh, the stepsister of Alexander the Great. By the time of Paul's ministry, Rome had controlled Thessalonica and uh, the region of Macedonia for about 200 years. Uh, Thessalonica, by this point, had actually become an independent city for about a hundred years. It was actually ruled by uh, a group of individuals known as polytarchs. There were only about five or six of them there, but uh, this was the governing body that uh, ruled this entire city. It's kind of significant because as a free city, the city of Thessalonica actually was not occupied by Roman troops. Contrast with Philippi that would have been a uh, Roman colony and would have been occupied uh, by these troops. The city became very influential, very populous, and very wealthy. It was in part due to its location uh, as a secure harbor in the Thermaic Gulf. This resulted naturally, though, in a lot of commerce, uh, imported as well as exported goods. But it also was a significant city along the Roman road that was known as the Via Ignatia, named after an individual by the name of Ignatia. Basically, this road was designed to facilitate the ease of transporting soldiers from one end of the empire to the other end of the Roman empire to be able to squelch any type of rebellion. You may recall, at this point in time, historically, the Roman empire is a very, very vast empire. And there were a number of different rebellions. In fact, one of them actually uh, was in Macedonia. And that was in part what initiated uh, the building of this road. It was actually uh, quite amazing how they did it. It was about 19 feet wide and uh, consisted in some places of stones that were laid down. In other places, it was uh, hardly compacted sand and so forth. But it provided a significant level of travel that would extend all the way from uh, basically modern day Turkey all the way west to the Adriatic Sea. Somebody would then take a ship, they would get on another road called the Appia Way and they would take that all the way up to Rome. This was a system that was designed, quite interesting, that God knew what the gospel would need to be able to be spread much more rapidly and he did so at the expense of the Roman government. By the time of Paul's ministry there are many who believe the population of Thessalonica to at least 200,000 or more. Some of even uh, that I've seen in my study have suggested that it could have been as many as 250,000, a quarter of a million people. That's a very large city, uh, even in today's standards. 
Recognizing the importance of the city, it was vital that Christianity become settled in this city because once it was settled here, it would very easily continue with a, a great potential of going both directions, uh, east and west, eventually all the way to Rome. Someone described the significance of it by stating this, the coming of Christianity to Thessalonica was crucial in the making of it into a world religion. It was very significant because from here it would go, quite honestly, a bunch of directions. Biblically, the context of Paul's journey to Thessalonica begins in Acts chapter number 16. We're, I'm going to mention many of the events. We're not going to spend time reading through the text, but you may recall that he and Barnabas had a disagreement about John Mark and whether John Mark should be allowed to accompany them on the second missionary journey. The dissension became so sharp that the two of them agreed to part ways and Barnabas took John Mark and Paul chose a man by the name of Silas, also seen in the word of God as a man by the name of Silvanus. They began going through the uh, region that he and Barnabas had traveled through, primarily just to uh, strengthen the churches. And it seems as though they were uh, content to be on that type of route. Maybe they were trying to get to Ephesus. We really do not know uh, where it was that they were ultimately going. When they arrived at two cities, uh, Derby and Lystra, they were also met by a young disciple, a man by the name of Timothy. From that point on, Timothy would continue with them uh, on their journey. As the three of them traveled throughout Asia Minor, eventually it reached a point when God did not allow them to continue. They reached closed doors. It's kind of interesting how that God does these things and uh, why God does them. There are often answers that we may never know. And, and we could reason through and say, well, uh, were there unsaved people in that region that needed to hear the gospel? The answer to that would be yes. Were there, was there not a need for churches to be established in that area? And, and again, I believe the answer to that would be yes, but it was not God's will for them to go through there. It brings me to two points that I want to mention before we look into some of the texts in Acts 17. Number one, a need does not constitute a call. Just because there is a need somewhere does not mean that God is calling you to go solve that need. And secondly, a desire does not automatically indicate God's will. Just because you want to do something does not necessarily mean that it's God's will. I know when Amy and I graduated uh, from Bible college and shortly early on in our ministry, our anticipation was that we would go west and pastor a church there. I couldn't wait to get out of North Carolina and I, I didn't even want to get settled here because I didn't want to sidetrack what God was calling me to do and and, uh, well, I'm still here 17 years later, not sidetracked at all from uh, what God called me to do. Uh, was that desire there? Yes. Was it God's will? The answer to that is no. Well, Paul and the men never did sit idly by doing nothing. They instead continued seeking God's direction in the matter and pursued various avenues and various doors, all of which God closed. It took a matter of time, but eventually Paul recognized that a closed door was equally as much an indication of God's will as an open door was. And so after some considerable time, Paul eventually got all the way to the edge of Asia Minor in a little town of Troas, and he received a vision from a man in Macedonia, the region that we're talking about. Man stood and said, come over into Macedonia and help us. And Paul immediately recognized this was God's direction for them. And so they immediately obeyed. And at this point in time, Luke joined them. And so four of them set sail from Troas up to the city of Neapolis, which would be the port. And then they went up to Philippi, the leading city of that area. The remainder of Acts 16 describes the ministry that was there in Philippi. It seemed to, in many ways, begin very well. They found a group of ladies that were uh, praying by the river, and among them was the first convert, a lady by the name of Lydia. 
they cast a demon out of a young girl. And as soon as they did that, however, they began to experience persecution. Upset that they were no longer able to make a profit from the, her soothsaying, the uh, individuals dragged Paul and Silas to the marketplace where they were wrongly beaten and imprisoned. But in spite of the injustice that had taken place that night and in spite of the pain that they were undoubtedly in, Paul and Silas, in Acts chapter 16, still praised God where they were. Well, what a marvelous testimony and what a wonderful challenge for us all to take place. There's a very interesting phrase that is actually stated in Acts chapter 16 and verse number 25 that just simply says this, the prisoners heard them. You know, there was something different about Paul and Silas. Some of you have worked in prisons, uh, typically Praising God in prisons is not generally the conversation that you hear. Uh, you hear plenty of conversation. Uh, none of it is fit to be repeated. None of it is kind. You can imagine in the same situation then that much of the same conversation would go on. But how differently Paul and Silas were as they sang praises to God. But I want you to understand that the prisoners heard them. No, when you find yourself in adversity, people pay attention and people will hear what you say and how you respond. Well, that night a great earthquake came and all the prison doors were opened and the jailer sensed that uh, he was about to lose his life and so he was just going to go ahead and take his own and immediately Paul cried out, do thyself no harm for we are all here. And that Philippian jailer came out with the famous word, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul had opportunity to be able to lead him to the Lord. And his whole family ends up being saved and ultimately ends up being baptized. And the next morning, the Roman leaders called them and said, All right, go ahead and send them on their way. And when Paul received that news, he said, Wait just a minute. <laughs> I am a Roman citizen and you have beaten me wrongly. And you're just now going to send me out as though this didn't happen. And as soon as they discovered that they were Roman citizens, they began to fear because what they had done was very wrong. They should have been granted a fair trial and they were not granted that at all. And so they came, the leaders themselves came and attempted to very quietly usher Paul and Silas out of the city of Philippi and they did exactly that. Well, they began walking now to the city of Thessalonica. It's about a hundred miles later. Now, you can imagine how they were feeling, and you can imagine uh, how their clothes would be sticking to their backs, and you can imagine the, the pain that undoubtedly these individuals were in. And off they go to the city of Thessalonica to continue ministering. Before I look at this, I want to ask a question that I think we would all do well to ponder. At what point would you have given up? At what point in time would we look at this and say, you know, this is absolutely no longer worth it? They're faced with incredible opposition and undoubtedly the wounds from the beating, yet these men continued walking to other cities to share the gospel. Their perseverance to do God's will regardless of the cost, I believe, provides us all with a tremendous example to follow. Did you know history is filled with individuals who faced incredible difficulties, yet they persevered with what God had called them to do? You've heard of men such as David Brainerd and Jim Elliott or Hudson Taylor. Many of these individuals did not see immediate fruit, yet they persevered and they abounded uh, and eventually the fruit oftentimes abounded even long after they had passed. I want to encourage you to persevere in spite of the difficulty sometimes in life. And let me remind you that God's work often abounds when God's people properly handle adversity. 
History is filled with examples of rulers and nations who attempted to completely terminate and squelch Christianity from their very existence within the nation's borders. Oftentimes it was during that time that the gospel flourished in times of great persecution because God's people handled that adversity correctly. We do well to, to learn from this. Paul expressed a desire in Philippians chapter number 3 where he wrote, that it is uh, doubtless, and I count all things, and I've highlighted some words, but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have noticed suffered the loss of all things, and to count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and notice the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. All of those phrases and words that are highlighted indicate that the path that you and I are on as believers is not going to be an easy path. Philippians chapter number 3, Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And then he urged, let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. And if in any other or if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this even unto you. You need to have the same mindset that Paul expressed here in Philippians 3 and verse 14, where I will press on toward the mark of the prize, where I will finish strongly, and I'll be faithful all the way to the end. I hope it's what every one of us wants. I truly believe that it is. We've got to make decisions on a daily basis that are going to take us to that destination. Paul and Silas and Timothy eventually arrived in the city of Thessalonica in Acts chapter number 17. Notice when they had passed through verse 1, Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. It seems as though they quickly passed through the two cities of Amphipolis and Apollonia on their way to Thessalonica, and it would appear as though there probably was not a synagogue there. And at this point in Paul's ministry, he is often beginning each of his uh, ministries uh, in, the city, in the synagogue. But there was a significant Jewish population there. And so Paul and these others who were accompanying him went to the synagogue. And he began reasoning with them. There was a kind of a format, a service that they would follow, so to speak, almost similar to how we have an order of service as well. And during the exposition of the scriptures, it would be opened up to others who would have comment and be able to interject. And Paul would always interject in these times and he would very passionately engage in debate and reasoning with individuals claiming that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that he died and that he rose again. This went on for the space of three weeks. That does not mean that his ministry in Thessalonica was only limited to three weeks. There are some other passages that would actually indicate that his ministry was a little bit longer than that, though it certainly was not terribly long. We find from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9, and even in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 8, that Paul said, I had to work to support myself while I was there. That probably would not be necessary if he was only there for a few weeks. Philippians 4 and verse 16 says that the believers in Philippi had sent once and again unto my necessity while he was in Thessalonica. They sent gifts to him on two separate occasions while he was there, probably not able to take place in a short period of three weeks. But for three weeks, he did reason in the synagogue with them and established a nucleus of believers. Some of them believed and consorted, according to verse 4, meaning that they aligned themselves with Paul and Silas, of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. There were the Jews, some Jews were saved, a bunch of Gentiles were saved, and there were even some influential ladies who also were saved. At some point in time, the unsaved Jews began to have a problem 
with Paul and with his message. And so the Bible says that the Jews which believe not moved with envy and took unto them, I love this phrase, certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. <laughs> Uh, these were uh, worthless and evil individuals, similar to a, a mob type thing, uh, uh, gangsters. You might even relate it to that. People who would just be in it to, to start a fight. People who would be in it to, to start some sort of an uprising. And they gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason, who appears to have been one of the converts that was housing these individuals and sought to bring them, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and so forth, out to the people. And when they found them not, they weren't there, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city. Now keep in mind, they were going to bring Paul and his men out to the people, but when they were only able to get Jason, they brought Jason out to the rulers. There, right there, the, the term rulers is where they get the polytarchs. That's the Greek term uh, that's actually used there. And so, I think it's the only place in the New Testament where it's actually used. For years, everyone thought that uh, this was just an error in the New Testament until they found some inscriptions that uh, actually testified to this group existing. Kind of interesting. It's amazing to me how, uh, quote unquote, scholars always say, well, if we can't find the evidence, of it, then the Bible must be wrong. Um, well, that's not the case. Even if we don't find evidence of it, the Bible is always right, and we can trust it regardless of what archaeology ever discovers, okay? Uh, did the ark uh, land in the mountains of Ararat? Yes. Does that mean they're going to find it? Well, you read this article, oh, they found it. Whatever. My point is, it doesn't matter. The Bible said this is what happened, and that's therefore what happened. But anyway, they brought him before these rulers of the city, and, and um, they began this accusation, verse number six. They had found them not. They drew Jason, certain brethren of the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. And these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. Uh, they are, uh, I know we might look at the phrase and say these that have turned the world upside down and use this kind of as a compliment. I can assure you that this was not intended as a compliment to uh, these individuals. This was intent, instead intended as a uh, quite an accusation against them. Uh, historically, Claudius, about this time, uh, actually expelled the Jews from the city of Rome. Uh, Paul is going to here in just a little while travel to Athens and then he's going to go from there to Corinth where he meets two people by the name of Aquila and Priscilla who had recently been expelled from Rome to Corinth. The reason they were expelled was because there was a kind of a uh, Messiah type group that was going around and causing a lot of problems. And it's quite possible when these individuals make this accusation, whether word has already reached them or not regarding the emperor's decision, we do not know. But the, point, the whole point of it is, look, these people that have been going throughout this Roman Empire causing so much problem are here also. And they're going about and claiming that there is another of a different sort of king. And his name is Jesus. This would be one of the most serious accusations that could lend itself to all sorts of problems for the one who is claiming this as well as for the entire city. And so the rulers of the city did not improperly just react as they did in Philippi. Now, I will say this, I know we can look at this from a biblical perspective, but if you put yourself in the minds of the unsaved individuals who are here, what do they know about this Jesus? It wouldn't take much of a search at all, historically, to find out about this person. Now, we know he's God. If you were going through the scrolls and of what had transpired, you would find this man was condemned to die by a Roman judge, for claiming that he was king of the Jews. So what would you think if you were unsaved? Do you see the problem? And put yourself in their shoes for just a little while and understand what it was uh, that they are faced with. And so they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. Kind of like Baal. 
<laughs> uh, kind of like bond in essence. Jason, you ensure that these people are no longer going to cause problems. And if you do so, and it seems as though he actually gave them money, perhaps he was uh, wealthy or at least influential, and he did so. And then the Bible says, the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. It's interesting that it seems like things are going well. The unsaved Jews incite a crowd to anger, and Paul and Silas are suddenly forced to flee under cover of darkness. I don't know how you look at this, but I look at this as it seems as though God's work was interrupted. It seems as though his ministry in Thessalonica, though we do not know exactly how long it lasted, his ministry was cut short, humanly speaking. Perseverance is very difficult when, it, when you perceive that something is being interrupted. But I want you to understand that it is absolutely essential. Maybe you have felt in your life that your life took an unexpected turn that was in many ways an interruption to your schedule and to your ideas and to your ambitions, to your plans. Not that you were guilty of doing something that was unbiblical. Paul certainly was not guilty of that. But why is it that, that God allowed this group of men to, to cause such an uproar and, and create such a hindrance now to the gospel? How do we handle this when God's work seems to be interrupted? Well, number one, realize that God is never taken by surprise. Never. You might be, and many times we are taken by surprise. Okay? Uh, what is Hurricane Irma going to do? <laughs> we don't know. There's not a meteorologist who does know, but God knows. God knows exactly where that's going to go, and God is capable of redirecting that thing to where we don't even get a drop of rain. God can do that. God is never taken by surprise. He's not taken by surprise in your life individually, in your lives as a family, in our lives corporately as a church. God is never taken by surprise. And so when it seems as though there's some sort of an interruption, realize that God's work is never taken by surprise. Also realize, number two, technically his work is uninterrupted. God's work will continue in spite of all of the attempts to thwart it. You remember what Jesus told Peter, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter, <laughs> the gates of hell are going to attempt to prevail against it. But they will never succeed at prevailing against it. It may appear that way. But we can rest assured that even though circumstances are difficult, God's work still continues on. Paul and Silas are literally forced out of the city of Thessalonica. And when he leaves the city, as we will see in our study, he has no idea what is going to take place to this work. Are they going to... Uh, are they going to survive? Are they going to uh, be able to, to manage all of these things? And, and the questions would be very difficult as they would go away. Would his work last? Were they strong enough to persevere? Did he do enough? What's going to happen to these individuals who've been saved? And you know, Paul is going to get word from Timothy, hey, the church is still in existence. And Paul's going to go, wow, praise the Lord. I, I thought for sure that church was going to be gone. And it wasn't at all. In fact, it wasn't only existing. It was thriving. Why? Because Paul and Silas didn't give up. So they continue. <laughs> leave one city, leave Philippi, go 100 miles after having been beaten. Now you're kicked out of Thessalonica. Well, let's go to another one. So we go about 40 miles south, uh, southwest rather, Thessalonica. This is off the Via Ignatia, the Ignatian Highway. Let's just say it this way. Hey, let's get off the beaten path here. 
Okay, let's get down to where maybe we're going to be able to have a, a ministry that's going to be able to succeed and, and where we're able to going to be a blessing and so forth. And so they get down to Berea and once again, they enter the synagogue there in, in Berea. But the Bible says that these, verse 11, were more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. There was an eagerness that they had towards Paul's message that did not characterize those in Thessalonica. Paul had to argue and debate and try to persuade them in Thessalonica. Not so in Berea. Bereans, who were, by the way, unsaved at this point in time, took what Paul said and they eagerly received it and they began comparing it with what the Word of God said. They searched the Scriptures daily to see if what Paul had said was so. That is unsaved people. How much more should a saved person be searching the Scriptures? A whole lot more. But this was their attitude. It had to have been refreshing to Paul to, to finally be sensing, man, this is good. And then the Jews from Thessalonica heard that Paul was in Berea. Good night. And so all of a sudden they go down there. Verse number 13, when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea. They came thither also and once again stirred up the people. <laughs> Paul was now forced to leave and head towards Athens. Verse 14, immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, notice, as it were to the sea. He didn't actually go. They, they we're going to fake this and they're going to end up sending him to Athens. Paul, uh, Silas and Timotheus abode there still in Berea. And Paul goes down, verse 15, to Athens. Now, I can't imagine how Paul would have felt was his ministry in this region a success and I know that we're to define success properly and, and but I'm gonna say as a preacher it's hard to define a success in a ministry because you the, how do you measure it it's just so intangible on a lot of ways and the very tangible things are often the things that we try to emphasize money and attendance okay and so we look at those things and and often that's what defines a ministry was Paul's ministry successful? Uh, what would happen to, to those that he left behind? I, I can't imagine being Paul uh, on the way to Athens wondering all of these questions. Uh, one of the commentators that I read, a man by the name of F.F. F. Bruce, made this statement, and I thought it really it kind of explained it well. The first gospel campaign in Macedon in the light of the sequel can be recognized as an illustrious success. In other words, when we read the account in 1 Thessalonians, we can see Paul's ministry was a huge success. But I want you to notice this. But at the time when Paul was compelled to leave the province, it must have felt as a heartbreaking failure. Nothing went right in the entire region. He was wrongly beaten in Philippi. He was falsely accused in Thessalonica, forced to leave at night. The unrest continued to follow him. And now he's completely out of that region in Athens, down in southern Greece. And we do know that later on, Paul would have an opportunity to later revisit the region of Macedonia on his way to Corinth. Uh, this would be on his third missionary journey, probably five to seven years later. And he would have opportunity to be encouraged by what God had done through his ministry. But I want you to understand, when 1 Thessalonians was written, he had no idea what it was that took place. And I'll share just a little bit more of this in a minute. Who's the author of this? Well, the traditional Pauline authorship is obviously going to be the best. There are some who say, well, uh, if you look in 1 Thessalonians, and you can turn to 1 Thessalonians 1, what you'll see is three names mentioned, Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus. Does that mean that all three of them were authors of it? I do not believe so. Some will point to the we statements that are found in uh, all throughout 1 Thessalonians. To me, probably 
Paul dictated it. It may be that Timothy penned it down, but it would be reasonable that the three men who were so instrumental in the beginning of this ministry would have been sending greetings and so forth to them, but Paul is still going to be the author. When did all of this take place? His second missionary journey, we know, began somewhere around either AD 49 or 50. And his entire ministry throughout the entire region of Macedonia was extremely short-lived. Uh, we just saw he wasn't in any city for very long before trouble forced him uh, to go on. He was accompanied alone to the city of Athens by someone from Berea. We do not know who that was. But he wanted to be sure that Paul got to Athens alone. When you read in Acts, but then you also have to read in 1 Thessalonians 3 to, to try to put all of this together, because if you just go through the Acts account, it, does, it sounds as though uh, Paul never meets up with Silas and Timothy until Corinth. But 1 Thessalonians 3 actually gives us a little bit more insight, and for sake of time, just allow me to summarize it. Paul is going with someone from Berea down to Athens. When he gets there, he observes how that Athens is wholly given to the city of to the sin of idolatry, and he sends word back with this individual, hey, send Timothy and Silas here as quickly as you can. Based on 1 Thessalonians 3, Timothy and Silas actually do arrive and meet him in Athens. And when they got there, they determined it was best to send Timothy back to Thessalonica to get word of how those believers were doing. Now, I know we talk about Timothy being a timid young man. Would you want to go back there? Uh-uh. I'm sure they're doing fine, Paul. I've been praying for them, okay? Uh, we'll see if we can get an email from them or something. Paul, there's got to be. And Timothy goes right back there. Silas goes somewhere. We don't know where. He goes also back into the region. It may be that he went to Berea. It may be that he went to Philippi, and we do not know. Well, Paul ends up then in Athens while Timothy is gone back to Thessalonica and Silas is gone somewhere. Paul ministers in Athens. Then Paul goes to Corinth. And it's there that Timothy and Silas meet back up with Paul. And Timothy brings him the word that says, hey, this church... These people that we saw saved, Paul, they are not only saved, they are thriving. This church, Paul, you wouldn't believe it. From this church has sounded out the word of God throughout this entire region. This is one of the churches that ends up being commended in first or second Corinthians eight and nine as one of the churches in Macedonia who gave significantly to the contribution that was taken up for the saints in Jerusalem. Paul, you wouldn't believe everything that's going on there. Filled with uncertainty for perhaps months. Can you imagine the joy that came across Paul's mind when he heard, hey, these guys are doing well. Praise the Lord. And he begins to sit down and begins to write what probably is the earliest of all of the letters in the New Testament, putting it somewhere around either late A.D. 50, maybe as late as early A.D. 51. One of the first ones, probably the first one uh, that was actually sent there to them. To whom's it written? Well, we know that it's written to the believers in Thessalonica, and I want to mention just a couple of things about them. They have a commendable testimony. The book of 1 Thessalonians, as we will read through it, is a book that is filled with a lot of praise. There's a lot of good things that are going on there. They're doing a lot of things right. But they weren't perfect. In fact, there's some divisive questions that take place in 1 Thessalonians 2 that Paul has to answer. You see, there are some people who began kind of reasoning, well, you know, yep, they came, and sure enough, they created enough problems for us, and where are they now that we're experiencing all these problems? It, it was a significant challenge to be a Christian in Thessalonica. Well, where are those guys that started this? Oh, yeah, yeah, they left at night. Yeah, mm-hmm. What does that say about those guys? What does that say about their message? Well, 
He deals with that in 1 Thessalonians 2. And he is able, because of how he conducted himself, even though he was there for a short time, he was able to rely on their knowledge. He said, you guys know firsthand how I behaved myself when I was here. You know that I was above blame and I was above reproach. What a testimony. Now, there is some biblical correction that also takes place in this particular book. They held on to some of the same tendencies that had characterized them before salvation. In 1 Thessalonians 4, about the first eight or nine verses, we'll, we'll find that there is a problem with immorality. Uh, the Gentiles had been saved from a, uh, an idolatrous background. Immorality was rampant and um, perfectly acceptable in the city of Thessalonica. Nobody had any problem with it. Uh, all of the idolatry that was there and uh, all of the sexual promiscuity, it was just natural. It was fine. Nobody had any problem with this. Paul said, wait a minute, guys. <laughs> You're different now. This isn't to characterize you anymore. And then there were some other problems that came about. Some had quit working uh, because they were anticipating the Lord's return. And Paul says, You're being a burden on some of these other people, so, so you can't do that either. What's the theme? And I'll mention this and we'll be finished. It's the coming of Jesus Christ. And when you go throughout this entire book, you'll find that this is mentioned in at least once in every single chapter. Notice 1 Thessalonians 1 and uh, verse number 10. To wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which hath delivered us from the wrath to come. Chapter 2 and verse number 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not ye even in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? Chapter 3 and verse 13. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. We're familiar with chapter 4 verses 13 through 17. I would not have you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. And I'm not going to take the time to read through that particular one. Chapter 5 and verse 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Every single chapter deals with this theme of Jesus Christ coming. The parousia of Jesus Christ. The coming of Jesus Christ. And it's the first book that even deals with this. Very important and very influential. Does it mean that it's just relating to what we commonly refer to as eschatology, the events of the last time, the last days? Absolutely not. Because Paul tells these people, I want you to live your life in such a way that you're faithful all the way to the end. That's what I want. It's what I want for you as a church, what I want for you as an individual. It's what I want in my own personal life. To hear the words at the end of your life, well done, thou good and faithful servant. To be able to be as Paul and say, you know what, I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. I was faithful all the way to the end. God, there were periods in my life I couldn't figure out what you were doing, but I was faithful. God, there were difficulties, but I was faithful in them. God, rarely did things go right in Macedonia, but I was faithful. Take a look. What a challenge for us. And that's an exciting book. I'm looking forward to it. It's a, uh, really, in a lot of ways, a, an easy book to just sit down and read through. You can read through uh, both First and Second Thessalonians relatively quickly and gain a lot of insight as to what the Lord's doing and what His coming is going to be like. A lot of parallels between this and Matthew 25. And, and it's pretty amazing when we begin to see how God has all of these details laid out. And these people lived as though He was going to come back during their lifetime. Now, 2,000 years later, we've lost that sensitivity. And I don't understand how in the world we are not that much more eager and that much more in anticipation that Jesus Christ could return tonight. Have you thought about it today? Probably. Some of us have. Most of us probably have not. I hope that it's something we really anticipate and say, you know what, I truly expect he's going to come back in my lifetime. That's how they lived. How much more should we live that way? Wouldn't it be great if we were just raptured out of here tonight? Uh, I've told you guys there's no more funerals in this church. All funerals are canceled. Uh, we are only going by means of the rapture, all right? So uh, none of you can take a liking to dying, all right? We're going out of here at the same time, all right? Let's pray and we'll press on.